Okay, so who's planning on having a big feast today or tomorrow? I know June said she, oh yeah. Oh yeah, June's cooking a turkey and I assume all the fixings. Um, Anybody having anything strange to eat for Thanksgiving? Yes, Lola will be having kibble um, and she'll be grateful. Uh, One year at American Thanksgiving, my mother tried to talk me into having Dungeness crab for Thanksgiving dinner instead of turkey. And I I just, there was a small tantrum, I admit. Uh, I absolutely vetoed it. And I wish I could have that decision back because Dungeness crab is something you can only get on the West Coast and it is the best. And I kind of miss it. Anybody ever had it before? Oh, it's good stuff. Uh, And honestly, I don't actually like turkey all that much, but it's tradition, isn't it? And traditions are powerful things, aren't they? And food is a big part of our traditions. And it's that long weekend of the year when our minds are kind of fixed on food. So I've been reflecting on the heavenly banquet that God is preparing for us, and and it was kind of an interesting image in my head. Strange things happen in my head. I I pictured God sort of bustling about the kitchen, um, maybe with Julia Child as his or her sous chef, making a feast for us, and I kind of like that. In the beautiful, bountiful word that we're given, God has indeed prepared a feast for us. And creation is a feast for all our senses, our taste and smell and touch and hearing. And that's the real grace before our feasts. So I understand why we gather to give thanks as part of our tradition and as part of our worship together. And in doing so, we follow an ancient tradition. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, our gospel reading was from the gospel according to Luke, and it was about a man who was giving a big banquet. And I gave some thought to using that passage again, but then I thought to myself, oh, some of them might actually remember. And then she laughed and laughed. (laughs) But in that parable that Jesus told, he envisioned a people and a community that lived for and in celebration, and which actually passed judgment um, on, on people and communities that failed to prepare for the coming feast. So given that Jesus was talking to the elite, the rich, the privileged, about the poor and the lowly and the misfits and the sexual outlaws and the downtrodden, who he said were all invited to the feast, how ought we to respond to such a message? I think with gratitude. There was an article in the Toronto Star a few years ago on gratitude. I looked it up, it was actually about 15 years ago, but I I still have a copy in my old fashioned paper file labeled Thanksgiving. And most years around Thanksgiving, the Star publishes uh, little snippets from all kinds of people on what they're grateful for this Thanksgiving. And they're often really wonderful and diverse things, 25 words or less, and they're kind of kind of cool. And it all, culti- cu- it all culminated in an article on gratitude, which said, at this time of the year, we weigh the good and the bad, and now there are experts to help us get it right. Experts. There were some suggestions on how to be grateful, good, good suggestions actually, like keeping a gratitude journal, uh, practicing regular contemplation of the things we're grateful for, and most of all, keeping it fresh varying the ways you think about or express gratitude, and especially expressing gratitude directly. But you've got to pick a strategy that works for you. And the the article quoted a guy named Ulrich Schimak, who was a U of T professor of psychology who specialized in, get this, happiness studies happiness studies. He studied happiness. And what Shimak said is that gratitude makes people happy. Not the people who are thanked, but the people doing the thanking. Being grateful makes us happy. But he says, 
you have to keep it honest. You can't force it, you gotta keep it real. And focusing only on the good things in your life, he says, can bring only perhaps a fleeting happiness. Manufactured joy gets us nowhere. Empty, positive self-talk only convinces for a while, if at all. Remember a few weeks ago when I said in my sermon that I cannot stand those people who are always so perky and cheery without any apparent reason? That drives me batty. And I would put it that our celebration has to find itself in reality. And it has to find itself, or it can find itself, in the way of Jesus, who passionately invites everyone to the banquet. And that passion to include as many as you can find reveals God's desire for our inclusion and real celebration together. And that's how we can keep it real. But sometimes gratitude isn't the feeling that most of us can cultivate. And even on Thanksgiving, we may be more likely to concentrate on the turkey or the people around us than on giving thanks. But perhaps we'd feel differently about thankfulness if we realized the extraordinary power it has to improve our lives. I mean, something more than simply the the civilizing benefits of good manners. I mean, of course, it's admirable to show gratitude, and, and nothing makes people happier, I think, than showing kindness or generosity to someone who truly appreciates it. But the value in giving thanks goes far beyond mere transactional politeness. Gratitude is nothing less than the key to happiness. Let me repeat that. Gratitude is nothing less than the key to happiness. And for this penetrating insight into gratefulness, I'm grateful to a guy named uh, Dennis Prager, who's author, author of a book called Happiness is a Serious Problem. And what he says is this, there is a secret to happiness and it is gratitude. All happy people are grateful and ungrateful people cannot be happy. And we tend to think that it is being unhappy that leads people to complain. But it is probably truer to say that it is complaining that leads people to be unhappy. Become become grateful and you will become a much happier person. I'm gonna repeat that too. Complaining makes us unhappy. What makes us unhappy is complaining. (laughs) Have I made my point? (laughs) Okay, being grateful makes us happy. Um, but complaining all the time is absolutely guaranteed to make us unhappy. And this observation, I think, helps explain why the Judeo-Christian tradition places such an emphasis on thanking God. And the history of the Jewish people in the Hebrew scriptures is full of the ways that people gave thanks, from feasts to psalms, Mark read one of them a minute ago, and Christian liturgy is filled with expressions of gratitude. It is good to give thanks to God, begins the 92nd Psalm, and in communion, every week we say, it is right to give God thanks and praise, right? Why? Because God needs our gratitude? No, because we need it. Learning to be thankful, whether to God or to other people, is the best vaccination, if you will, against taking goodness for granted. And the less we take for granted, the more pleasure and joy we find in life. We cultivate that sustaining joy that carries us through. And if we never give a moment's thought to the fact that perhaps our health is good, that we're well-fed, sometimes overfed, that we have roofs over our heads, that our nation is at peace, and if we assume that the good things in life are just to be expected, then we're deliberately diminishing the happiness that those things can bring us. And what's the sense in that? On the other hand, if we affirmatively train ourselves to reflect on how much worse off we could be, on how good we have it, as compared to the rest of the world, we grow a different kind of attitude. You know, how much worse off could we be? 
When you eat your turkey, reflect a little on this. Because Janet and I have a refugee from Uganda living with us for now, I have become much more aware of what life in Uganda is like than I ever was before. And one thing I have learned recently is that the cost of maize, corn, which is the most basic staple in that region, has more than doubled, actually almost tripled, just in the past year. Maize flour, or cornmeal, is what people eat when they can't afford anything else. And I'm, I'm, I was scratching my head trying to figure out what would be a Canadian parallel. What's cheap and filling? Bread? Oatmeal, yes, imagine living on nothing but oatmeal. Imagine if the price of poutine suddenly skyrocketed. Yeah. Anyhow, there are a lot of reasons for the price hike. Bad crops in Australia, lousy weather, the high cost of oil, the diversion of farmland, farmland to other more profitable crops, uh, not to mention the war in Ukraine, Ukraine, and frankly, price gouging, capitalism. And it may not be a big deal to you, but to people for whom maize is the main staple of their diet, for those for, uh, for whom it may be the only thing they have, that is life shattering. One of the things I've been doing lately, and I, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, is I'm now following the little MCC church in Kampala in Uganda. There's one little MCC church in Uganda. And every week, they post pictures on Facebook of the 20 or 30 little kids they feed on Sundays. And these are kids who are either living with HIV themselves or who have been orphaned by AIDS. And every week, the pictures show a bunch of happy little kids eating what? Eating what? Posho, which is basically cornmeal mush. And I gotta tell you, they look very grateful, very happy. And I don't want to spoil your Thanksgiving dinner, but when you eat your pumpkin pie, reflect on that. I reflect on the fact that my fridge is full, my pantry is full. Janet says the fridge is over full and I have to play three-dimensional Tetris to jam anything else in. I'm baking pies this afternoon to take to a friend who's having us over for a small banquet tomorrow. And we may not be rich by some North American standards, but we don't want for anything. And I do a bit of internal grumbling from time to time about the wish I, things I wish I had, and that doesn't make me happy because all my needs are met. And when I compare just the bounty in my little tiny kitchen to the rest of the world, it is absolutely mind-boggling. And the only way I can keep my mind from being boggled is to be grateful, deeply grateful for what I have. And it gives me joy, it inspires me to share, and that is the purpose of gratitude. And if we develop the custom of counting our blessings and being grateful for them, then we fill our lives with joy. Trust me on this. And when I stress out over church finances, I have to remind myself not to focus on the gifts we receive, but on the things we give away. The refugee program, the Triangle School, our emerging human rights work, and I reclaim that gratitude. And the joy carries me forward. And it reminds me of that heavenly banquet to which all people are invited. And I'm not saying that this is easy. It really can be hard to do sometimes. And like most useful life skills, it takes years of practice before it becomes second nature. And that book I mentioned by this guy, uh, Prager, he writes that religion, sincerely practiced, leads to happiness because it ingrains the habits of thankfulness. And people who thank God before each meal, for example, inculcate gratitude in themselves, and in so doing, we open the door to gladness. We invite in joy. How do we become thankful? It takes a certain humility of spirit and a sensitivity 
to the kindness and goodwill of others, and the grateful person regards another person's maybe small act of kindness, and we experience in that God's grace with profound appreciation, because life itself is a gift. And those ancient harvest festivals that we read about in the Hebrew scriptures that form the foundation for our Thanksgiving holidays, make no mistake about it, they weren't just giving thanks for a good harvest, but for life itself. And those ancient folks who gathered what they'd reaped and took it into their temples were saying, thank God, thank you God, we're gonna make it through another winter. We'll live for one more year. Now that's true gratitude for life. And in a sense, gratitude's an expression of humility. In Hebrew, the word for gratitude, hoda'ah, is the same as the word for confession. You know, like we do in our, our uh, prayers of, uh, for forgiveness and, and assurance. That's gratitude. It's to offer thanks is to confess our dependence on God and our interdependence on one another. And maybe that's why some folks have trouble saying thank you. You know, you don't want to admit that you're not totally self-sufficient. Well, spoiler alert, you are. But we need to acknowledge that others have the power to benefit us. And we need to admit that life is better sometimes because of someone else's efforts and because of God's gifts to us. So be thankful. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Don't take our gifts in life for granted. And whoever and wherever we are this Thanksgiving, the good in our life will get us through the hard times. And if that doesn't deserve our gratitude, then what the heck does? Amen? Amen. Amen.